longer the kid charge and goes out. <laughs> and uh, you can hand it out, it's moved. As well as uh, a copy of the ballot. There's a book to ballot for the for peer judging. So I'm going to double check that I put it in the right place. Okay, I think I'm ready. Okay. Uh, let me... Uh, Yeah, yeah, that's on mine. It's a little, it's a little less uh, awkward. For me. Okay. Yeah. I told him I thought. Uh, That's yeah, okay. This Testing. No, we'll use this. Just a second. Just a second. We have a. Uh, <laughs> I know. We like your attitude. Very easy. <laughs> Let me explain. Okay. Okay. So everyone should have uh, a copy of the listing of the presenters for both the snapshots and the posters, um, as well as a copy of the uh, poster judging ballot. Okay, so let me remind you and just go through uh, the rules, which will be the ones that we follow for all the sessions. This is the first session. So we start with this session, which is the snapshots. Um, they will be presented one after another. They're all in a list. And basically, each person in turn, in order, will come up. Notice that on this sheet, the, the poster, list of poster presenters, there is a number. Okay, that's the number you would use when you're judging the poster, you're ranking them. Uh, they're all indicated by this number. When you go out to the posters after the snapshots, there's the posters which are posted uh, in, on this floor but toward the back. Each poster will have that same number on it. So that how, is how you keep track of the snapshot, connect that with the person connected to the poster. Okay, so we start with the poster, the snapshots, two minutes, um, and then after that we'll all proceed out to that session, uh, the poster session, walk around. Uh, presenters, please stand by your posters to um, be ready to answer questions there. Okay, now let's talk again about the judging, the three criteria. Uh, scientific content, um, the actual poster layout display, and presentation, which is both the snapshot oral presentation here as well as uh, the presenter's ability to, to respond to questions at their poster station. Uh, let's talk a little bit about judging again. The faculty hands-on judges will comprise one panel and Y'all, who are the peers of the presenters, will be the other set of judges. Let's focus on that. This is the ballot that you have as peer judges. Um, using that number, a numbering system according to this, uh, you rank in order with first place, second place, third place, fourth place, fifth place. Okay? 
There are, uh, then in order mentioned, there's a poster judging, peer judging drawing. Uh, once we collect all the ballots, we'll take one of those ballots, draw one of those uh, for a 20 euro prize. Uh, that drawing is not going to happen today. It happens at the start of the next poster session, snapshot session. Okay? So next Tuesday, at this time, when we do the second session, to kick things off, We'll take the poster ballots from everyone who's voted uh, and put their name down, right? We have to know who you are to give you your money if, you're, if you happen to be drawn. Um, we'll take and draw from that, um, uh, draw for that uh, 20 euro prize. Now, um, so you're, when you're judging, you're judging both uh, one, two, three, four, five, the top five, the presentation here, snapshot, as well as the poster session. So. You don't mark it in here and then turn it in. You need to both listen to the presentations here as well as view the posters. Okay? When you've marked your, when you've completed your ranking, then Megan, who is our official UN election monitor, <laughs> will take this official UN sanctioned election ballot box and walk around and you can uh, cast your poster ballots in this box. So Megan's in the back. Raise your hand, Megan. To look for her, uh, but that will happen later. Okay. Now there was a question about how are uh, these three separate sessions. So uh, what we do is we do select for every session the top five in this session, um, but in the overall ranking, everybody, all sessions compete with each other. Okay. So there will be a selection of for your ballots the top five. Next, uh, next Tuesday, you'll select five more. Next Thursday, five more. But all of those compete all together for the, the sequence, the set of prizes. Does that answer your question? Yes. Other questions about that? Mark? Do I have to be here on Tuesday at the drawing to win? You, uh, it should say, yeah, must be present to win. Okay, yes. You, yes, thank you for pointing that out. If you're not here next uh, at the start of the next poster session and you judged and voted for this session and we draw your name, you don't get the 20 euros. We keep drawing until the person, until we have a judge who's written their name, they've cast a ballot, their name gets drawn and they have, they're here. Okay? So that's uh, an important point. Other questions? Yes. Are there some, sorry? Weights. We will let you decide, each judge will decide how they want to weight those, okay? So you you decide and, and uh, try to be consistent, right? The same, you use the same criteria today as Tuesday as Thursday, okay? As long as you're consistent, then it will all work out. Other questions? Okay. Now, let's talk about the specifics. Uh, yeah, sorry. Yes, Lou. Uh, if you win the drawing today, are you still eligible to win the other two drawings? Uh, <laughs> so first of all, you won't know if you won the drawing today because we're not drawing today. We're drawing next Tuesday, okay? Um, so if you keep voting as a judge, you keep getting entered into the ballot, uh, into the, the raffle, into the, so if you get drawn more than once, but uh, here's the way we'll do it. Uh, okay, actually. <laughs> One over 57. So we typically have the, the past winners are the next drawers. Um, oh. So uh, it'll look funny if you draw your name. <laughs> it has happened. Something such, some such thing has happened where the person drew their name a few years ago. But it's, you'll be able to see the drawing happening here. We mix it up. person reaches in, pulls, pulls out a name. Yeah, so you're all, you're, you keep be getting, you're, you're, you are continue to be eligible. Other questions? Okay, now let's talk about the specifics of how we're going to run, um, run this. Okay, so this is, um, so uh, the snapshots, we're going to go ahead and start. So in turn, each person will come forward. You have your listing, you know your number. Um, so Bruce is going to uh, present the 
Um, yes, why don't you pull, pull those up? Okay, so this will look like something, hopefully. Something. Yeah. All right, so every snapshot will start with this, right? Your number, the number. So judges have that in mind. The number comes before the presentation, so you know in which order. Um, so that also is a clue to you, uh, who are the, the presenters, that yes, you need to come up and according to this schedule in this order, okay? I will put on a microphone, so we need to have a microphone so you can be heard. So I'll hand you, I'll clip this on and hand you this. We have also a laser pointer that you can use. So the top button is a laser pointer. Um, you can also choose to advance the slide. So I'm just going to do this once and so there's an advanced button here. But if that's, you, you're too nervous to do that, just focus on the laser pointer and Bruce will advance it for you. Okay? <laughs> so you decide how you want to do this. Okay? Well, no, everybody who put a thank you slide, that does not exist. No, 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 no. don't click for your thank you. Yes. A slide that says thank you, those are all gone. And, and we'll, name names. we'll hold the applause to the end because we have eight or 17 of these we're going to run through. So we'll have uh, the applause at the end. Okay, after I clip on the microphone, hand you your um, uh, laser pointer uh, advancer, I will announce, introduce you. So wait for that, okay? <laughs> Don't launch into it, okay? I'll introduce you and then um, you can deliver your snapshot. Now, one final thing, uh, we are, Going to time. Here's the timer. Pull the timer up here so we can see it. Uh, it's all computer. Yes. No fighting the computer. Yes. There's the timer. Very clear. It went down. It went down. Okay. Uh, we'll bring it up. No, Don't what do you mean? No. <laughs> oh, it's yeah, it's there. Okay, good. So there's the timer. So you present, presenters will stand here and present from this side. So you can see your presentation, you can see how much time you have. There will be an audible signal when your time is out. That's we'll it. We'll see what that audible signal is. Okay. All right. Any questions about that? Yes. You will see that it won't be possible to do that. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll be well, you, to Yes, to yes. no, we have, we have two minutes for everybody. Two minutes, so it keeps it fair for everyone. Don't follow the example of a number of our um, session leaders who ran over. <laughs> And I won't mention any names. <laughs> we were keeping to a very strict two-minute uh, time limit. I can. That wasn't subtle. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions? All right. Let's go ahead and get started. Come on. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So our first presenter is uh, Nirmal um, Narath. I don't have it spelled right. Uh, Natarajan. Natarajan. Thank yeah. you. Uh, from the Valori Institute of Technology in India, and he'll tell us about his work which is entitled Topological Characterization of Time Series Data Using Network Graphs. So it's fantastic to see you uh, all for my talk. And I'll jump into the talk straight away. We all love Fourier transforms and FFT to analyze our time series data. The reason is if you have a noisy signal, you can pick out 
your signal from the noise, and you know this is the signal, if it is periodic. But you are in a trap if you have a chaotic or an intermittent solution. And we could use a method which will map time series into networks and a method which I'm going to use is called the visibility algorithm. What it does is that you can represent the time series as a stack plot or a candlestick plot, connect the peaks if it has a line of sight. If this and this is not in the line of sight, there is no connection. But this and this is having a connection, so you connect it. And you can display it in any grid you like. It. So further, I can ask what I can learn by constructing it into a network. Now, you can see that connections can be of two or three types. One is you have a three-node network, a uh, sub-network connected to a two-node sub-network, which has a common vertex. And this is a lower topological level uh, compared to this, which has a common link, which is at a higher topological level. And it so happens that for periodic orbits, I have more number of lower topological level connections than that of the chaotic and intermittent stuff. Just the opposite happens for chaotic and intermittent time series data, where I have more number of such data. And this offers better way to analyze things rather than the common network analyzers. So visit poster number one. Thank you. Okay. Anyway, is there a yeah. check? Check. Hit. Hello, everybody. Today I will tell you about the Leiden Frost phenomenon in conical plates. So I'll start by a little explanation of this well-known effect, which appears, for example, when we are cooking and we drop a little amount of liquid over a preheated substrate. Normally, we see that the liquid boils um, fast, but what happens if we increase the temperature of the substrate? Well, what we'll see is that the liquid doesn't boil any anymore, but levitates on its own vapor, avoiding the direct contact with the substrate. So it's evaporating slowly, and this is pretty amazing because we are heating more than before. So the main uh, problem is that this phenomenon has been studied a lot only on flat surfaces, but for a large number of applications, such as storing liquid uh, that were preheated before, we can find conical shapes. So uh, in order to explain this phenomenon on conical shapes, we have made the analysis of the equilibrium between uh, surface tension forces against gravity. We arrived to a system of nonlinear differential equations, and we solved it uh, numerically. Okay? By the way, we can find different regimes. And for example, on the top of this picture, we have the one with bubbles. Then the second is the oscillating patterns that appear. And finally, the quasi-stable regime. 
from the experiments, we have plotted a phase diagram. And finally, we studied the quasi-stable regime. To do that, we consider the heat transfer from the plate mainly by condu conduction. And the quasi will vapor flow below the drop. We arrive to these equations, and we'll solve it uh, numerically also. The results are pretty close from the reality. Anyway, we obtained many other interesting results. That is why I invite you to see my poster today. Thank you very much. from the University of Tehran in Iran, and he'll tell us about his work, which is entitled Energy Landscapes Reveal the Geometric Structure of Networks. OK. OK. I'm a neuroscientist. Uh, we study brain, the most complex system in the world. Uh, today, we are able to measure the connectivity between neurons. And uh, here, the question is that, uh, is there any geometric structure behind these measurements? Can we embed neurons? in a Euclidean space or not. Uh, putting this strength in a, uh, measurements in a matrix that uh, colors represent the value of the connections, we can assign a set of graphs to this matrix just, just by doing this, that uh, taking the biggest element here and uh, connecting the uh, row and columns that, there in the graph and adding the next biggest element. And uh, here we can have a set of graphs that just depend on the order of the elements of the matrix. Uh, we have, an, we have a phenomenon in uh, social sciences that is a friend of my friend should be my friend and enemy of my enemy also should be my friend. By this idea, we can have a graph that has these four kind of uh, triangles the, that these two are OK with the rule and these two are not OK. Uh, here we can uh, define a global energy for whole graph that is the count of number of this minus the number of all this. Uh, combining these two, not, not going Combining these two, we can uh, measure the energy for each graph in that set. And uh, here we uh, have these two curves that uh, randoms are distinguished from the structural matrix. And we can uh, distinguish them. Here we also can have some idea about the dimensionality of the original space that we can put the neurons. And also, this method is general. We can apply it whenever we have a coupling matrix in, and we want to the geometry of that. Better than my test. <laughs> okay. Let's do a few, more, a few more seconds because of technical difficulties to finish. Go ahead. For a few more seconds. Oh, that's OK. You're good? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, don't, don't keep punching your head. Wait. Some of your PDFs are big. Yeah, I don't know why, but they're very big. Okay, nicely done. So you can hold that and put it in your pocket. Testimentiano State University of Medicine and Pharmacy in Moldova. 
and she'll tell us about her work on nonlinear effects of electron lattice interactions in superconductivity. And we need to reset the clock. Right. That was really good. <laughs> Fast, I know. All right, ready? Hello, everybody. Uh, superconductors, materials that have no resistance to the electrical flow, they are new great frontiers to, in the discovery of the science. Some examples of the superconductors are levitation, uh, magnetic resonance imaging, or uh, even the large uh, hadron collider. In condensed um, uh, matter physics, uh, Cooper pair is a pair of electrons that are bound together at low temperatures and um, uh, they are described by barden cooper schiffer theory. Uh, the pair of electrons uh, have a lower energy than the Fermi en uh, energy, and that makes them to be bound together. Um, in semiconductors, these electrons interact with each other uh, uh, by photons, so this is an electron-photon interaction. And uh, my uh, work or my paperwork aims to research the big quantum interaction between um, electrons and to be compared with the single quantum interaction in the traditional um, barden cooper schiffer theory. As a result, uh, we achieved um, a maximum value of the order parameter in dependency of the temperature. And um, at low temperature, uh, the um, water parameter uh, increase, achieves a maximum, and then slowly decrease to a critical temperature. And actually, this slow decrease of the, uh, gives us a maximum value of the critical temperature comparing with the uh, original um, superconductivity theory by barden cooper schiffer And um, yeah, for those who are interest in my area of research, please be welcome to enjoy my poster. Thank you so much. poster will be presented by Elisha Are from the Federal University Oye Ekiti yeah. and Nigeria. And he'll tell us about his work on math the mathematical model of oleovirus disease with dead infectives, which offer insights into disease control. Ebola virus disease uh, is a very deadly virus. Uh, actually, Ebola is the name of uh, a river in Africa, the Democratic Republic of Congo. But I wonder if people will go there to have a swim now. <laughs> that would be very unlikely. Ebola was uh, a regional disease. The, out the first outbreak was in 1976, and it affected mostly sub-Saharan African countries. But in 2014, this deadly virus changed. The dynamics of the disease changed totally because it now moves away from uh, Africa. It was exported to the USA the UK, and even Italy. So it became a global problem at 2014, which was the, the most recent outbreak. What I did is to look at the total population at a given time, and the total population is divided into six at a time. The first compartment there shows the population of the susceptible people to Ebola. Now, virtually everybody in the population will be susceptible initially. Then the second compartment is the population of the latently infected, the third compartment is the population of the infected that are free to move in the community. Then the IH, which is the fourth one, is the population of those who are hospitalized. And ID, the population of the dead that are not yet buried. And actually, dead people, that, those that died because of Ebola, can actually still infect people and harm the population of the infected. If you look at my graph here, I have a forward bifurcation, the proportion of the infected people as against the production number. The reproduction number is actually the average number of people one infected person can infect in, the, in his lifetime of infectiousness. Come to my poster. 
I will tell you how, what bifurcation means in epidemiology and some other wonderful results I've derived from this model. Thank you. In the name of God, hello everyone. Now I want to speak about a method to analyze the cross correlation of fluctuation. First, I speak a little about fractals. Fractals has only one scaling exponent. If you focus here, you can see similar shape. But multifractal have infinite number of <coughs> scaling exponents. What is important in multifractality here is that if time series are multifractal, you can extract all statistical information, properties of them from this, with this method, like for a spectrum and the other. Here is some part of multifractal data, and <coughs> this is the result. The main part is to find a best polynomial can fit to your data that will not kill the fluctuation, but kill the trend, because this is method to kill, <coughs> to detrend your data, and then analyze the fluctuation. This is the, <coughs> we want to study the mutual information of two time series. And with this method, we put them in a universality class. Are they correlated or uncorrelated, or anticorrelated maybe? It means that are the fluctuations affect each other or not? And it's not depend on what kind of data do you study. Maybe it's sunspots and river flow. Maybe it's oil price and stock market. And not depend on dimension of a <clears throat> dimension or more thing else. Thanks for your attention. Hello everybody. I try to describe here a model which happens to be very close to what, um, to what we see in nature. And that's about cooperation. You see cooperation is very abundant in nature and we see that every day, every day. But natural selection challenges it. It says that if an individual is strong enough, it can survive in the environment. And now the question is, if you are strong enough to survive, why should you cooperate to others and why should you help others? But if cooperation exists, our models should, uh, should describe it. Now, this model, limited resource model, happens to be uh, very close to cooperation. Uh, you see, you can assign a resource, to, uh, a resource to every individual. And you can consider it as the money that you all have in your pocket. 
you can spend your money and you can share it with the others and probably without money you'll die. That's exactly happens here. You see in a series of interactions, resources can be changed through a, a, be the matrix, something like this. And the result will be a, sp a stable state in which cooperations can uh, happily uh, live together. Uh, but this has done on a, on a homogeneous population, which is not very real realistic because real populations do have structures. I try to challenge this model by adding a structure to it. And uh, I try to study about the aspects uh, that can be changed by adding this structure. Uh, I, if you're interested, I can describe the model in details and the results. And uh, with this brief summary, I'll end here. Thank you for uh, thank you for the thank you for listening. Okay, looking around, you can see a lot of devices that are working by radio frequency transmission. Did you ask yourself if this, uh, this, this energy is dangerous for us? We will divide these opinions into groups. Someone will tell that it's dangerous, someone will tell that it's not dangerous for a living matter. Uh, our question was, what is the maximal value of electric field in a normal city from Europe. We have city Baku from Romania. Yeah, here you can see the streets. And um, we measurement the electric field in 1600 uh, points using the portable dosimeter. So green colors, you can um, see the lower intensity of electric field. Uh, yellow colors, that means higher. And the red one, it's much higher intensity of electric field. What we found out is that maximal value of electric field is 2.2 volt per meter. If we compare with legal norm, that is 27 volt per meter. Uh, but uh, the maximal value of electric field in the city is for band G, um, GSM. That's one, what we developed. These results we'll use in the lab to treat that. Plant to, um, to treat the plants, but at the same time treat, uh, treating these plants with chemicals. And then we'll see the result. Thank you. Dear faculty members, dear fellow students, uh, thank you for uh, looking at my presentation here, which is about this beautiful shaped sand dunes that specialists, geomorphologists, call barhan dunes. My work is about monitoring these dunes, which are in the Sahara Desert, and as you will see in other places, and I use an icon of satellite to track their positions and uh, their shapes among, uh, along the time. Of course, these dunes 
can also be found in other planetary landforms as in Mars. We'll, we'll get back to this later. Actually, these dunes can be a threat to human activity. They can cover roads, they can cover uh, agricultural areas, and they generally could be a hazard for any human activity or settlement. These are the fastest sand dunes, and as you can see here, we can characterize them by three main curves. In red, it's called the foot, the, in the, uh, the green one is called the crest, and the blue one is called the avalanche. And in white arrows, you have the wind direction. So it's important to know uh, how they will progress along time, and also to, uh, they could be uh, something which is important to monitor surface wind activity in other planetary landforms. In my recent work, I have uh, uh, developed a model to get the surface wind uh, activity in Mars using the shape of these Barhan dunes. My work will uh, be about an active shape model, which is a computer vision model that uh, gets the contour of these uh, dunes. And, and I invite you to be at my poster to know much uh, more about the details. Thank you. So hello everyone. Excuse me. <laughs> Time didn't start. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so can I? No. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The tenth poster will be presented by a very eager Shumalia <laughs> Khan from the Comsats Institute of Information Technology oh. in Pakistan. And she'll tell us about her work on efficient transfer and imaging of graphene grains on dielectric substrates. So hello, everyone. As we know, single layer graphene has zero band gap. So we cannot use it for switching devices, faster switching devices. So uh, attention is diverted towards multi-layer graphene, where you can tune the band gap. And also, it has multiplicative effect. So it has applications in optoelectronics. So we grow multi-layer graphene by chemical vapor deposition on metal catalyst, platinum, uh, sorry. And then we uh, deposited PMMA on uh, graphene deposited platinum and put it in electrolytic solution. During electrolysis, uh, this platinum coated, platinum coated graphene electrode was used as a cathode. So hydrogen bubble moved towards this cath uh, cathode and peeled off graphene layer. So after peeling of this graphene layer, we scoop it out on the dielectric substrate. And with the optical images, we find out that potassium hydroxide and lithium hydroxide are more efficient in transfer and gave us very uh, larger area coverage as compared to um, barium hydroxide and sodium hydroxide. So after transfer, we also uh, try to find out what happened when two graphene crystals are in the process of merging, which was overlooked previously. And it is not possible to find out only with the help of uh, optical microscopy. So we used Raman imaging, Raman mapping to find out the stacking sequence inside the multilayer of carbon and also the number of layers. It is very important from uh, application point of view, device point of view. So I am presenting poster number 10. You are welcome to attend my poster. Thank you so much. <laughs> I forgot the introduction for that. Tanmoy Sarkar from the Indian Institute of Technology in Bombay. 
and he'll tell us about his work on the theoretical estimation of grain size distributions in polycrystalline solids under shear. Hello everyone. We are actually studying the polycrystalline material under applied shear. So first let me explain what do you actually mean by polycrystalline material. So for example, you can take a real polycrystalline material from nature, this is a piece of, meta piece of metal and if you want to know the actual internal structure, it will be like that, it will, it's, a, it's a snapshot, means it's a schematic snapshot of this material, internal structure. Here you can see the different color portions, these different color portions are representing different grains or different crystallites. What we have done, we have just taken a 2D snapshot of this kind of polycrystalline material and we have applied shear. And now we are interested in measuring the size, means the size of this grains because the grain size distribution of this kind of polycrystalline material you can relate this thing with the strength of the material. It is important because it is of some fundamental interest and it has some application in industry also. So it is a new, completely numerical study. So we have used phase field crystal methodology to simulate the polycrystalline material and we have used Means we have gener we have actually designed a new me new methodology to count the grain size distribution more accurately than the available methods, and we have also studied the system for different st applied strain rate. Okay, and for that, as a result, we have gotten different strain rate probability distribution when you have plotted it in reduced area, and we have found a power law distribution which is completely different from the distribution in the steady st in the equilibrium state. Means when there is no such kind of applied shear rate. So this is a new thing and this is a starting point of uh, being st starting points to study uh, connection between the applied, sh applied shear rate, the strength of the material and the grain size distribution. So I welcome you all to, present, to attend the poster session to know more about this thing. Thank you. by Driti Mahanta from the Indian Institute of Technology in Guwahati in India and she'll tell us about her work on uh, pinning of 3D chemical waves to branch heterogeneities. Thank you sir. Good afternoon everybody. My work is on pinning of three dimensional chemical waves which is commonly known as CROSS in the realm of nonlinear dynamics. So. Uh, this work is basically important because of their biological relevance. We know that when scroll waves are present in the heart, it may lead to some irregular heartbeats which is called cardiac arrhythmia and this condition is extremely dangerous and often life threatening. So what is a scroll wave? It is uh, just the three dimensional counterpart of a spiral. It has uh, a finite lifetime and it rotates around a one dimensional curve called a filament. So what happens if some heterogeneity is present in a medium? Then the scroll wave can get attached to the heterogeneities giving rise to some stationary signals which have elongated lifetime. So if uh, some closed loops are formed as a result of this spinning, then uh, it may have even finite, infinite lifetime and it is really dangerous for our cardiac health. So we try to see what happens if the uh, heterogeneity is very large. And uh, we used a belouzov jabotinsky reaction for our experiments and used a hexagonal mesh to, uh, as obstacle. Then we found that uh, pinning may occur giving rise to filaments of different geometries and the final shape of the filament depends on the initial waveform. As you can see here, these two waveforms initial conditions are look uh, means have uh, similar shape but different sizes and the final filaments are totally different. This wave period distribution curve indicates that the wave periods are function of symmetries of the final filament shape. And finally, we carried out numerical simulations using the simple Bartley model and found that uh, it, uh, 
it totally agrees with our experimental findings and explains how the filament evolves with time. Thank you very much. Most of you know optical tweezers are a well established technique for trapping and manipulation of particles from micro, nano to micro scale and um, apply to study different areas of science such as biological science, ecological science to observe the forces and dynamic interaction between them. In a simple case, optical tweezers are generated by using a focusing by focusing a laser beam. Um, by high numerical aperture objective lenses, and uh, three-dimensional trapping can be achieved. But in the case of low numerical aperture objective lens, only two-dimensional trapping can be obtained because in the axial direction, a scattering force overcomes the gradient force, and uh, just two-dimensional trapping we, we will have. A novel technique that we propose to for trapping the particle in, with low numerical aperture objective uh, is using a mirror in front of the focusing laser, laser beam. Oh, oh I, I did, did mistake. OK. Um, rays focus using a low numerical aperture objective uh, scattered are scattered by a spherical particle, and then reflect, uh, this scattered ray reflected from the are reflected from the mirror. This reflected ray can exert a, a, an additional force on a particle, and um, which enhances the trapping strength, uh, strength and causes the uh, partic push the particle to equilibrium position. We show that in some condition. The trapping strength is, can also, with the low numerical aperture objective in presence of mirror, can be even be, um, large, be even larger than the strength with the high numerical aperture optical trap. This technique can be okay. It's finished. Hi everybody, I'm going to talk about interesting phenomena of spreading and fingering instability of surfactant droplets. 
imagine we, um, first, maybe I should say that uh, surfactants are kind of material which can lower the surface tension. Imagine we have a droplet of surfactant with surface tension sigma 1 and a layer, liquid la layer with surface tension sigma 2. If sigma 1 is smaller than sigma 2, the droplet can spread on the surface. We say that Morangon is spreading. The interface of two liquids, I mean the um, droplet and the layer, is not uniform because we have fluctuations. And so different parts of the um, interface will feel different amount of surface tension gradient and consequently they will grow different, differently. It makes such a beautiful pattern, we say, fingering instability. Here you see fingering instability for a um, kind of polymer, but actually I like to work on uh, fingering instability of uh, surfactant on thick water layer. Here you see spreading and fingering instability on thick water layer. I have done many experiments on this, and here just one result. If we uh, measure the radius of the inscribed circle inside the pattern, we see a power low behavior with the power around 0.4. And I have a lot of other results, and it's a great pleasure for me if you come and see my result and also my poster and ask a lot of questions. Thank you. Chimera, it's from this mythological animal that it's composed by parts of different animals. But in dynamical system means that if you have a system, that system can be divided into or different groups. One order group or synchronized and uh, another disorder group. Um, clusters, on the other hand, are Clustering states may occur when the system splits in different order groups, but there's no incoherence on the system. And in the natural world, we can see many phenomena that may be related to these synchronization states, like, for example, the dolphin, uh, to avoid getting drowned, he sleeps with part of his brain uh, synchronized and the other part became, uh, uh, keeps incoherent. Uh, but the model I'm using is way, way more simpler than uh, uh, the dolphin. It's just a chaotic map, 1D map, that presents robust chaos. Here's the robust chaos, there's no periodic window. So when you couple these elements, you can see that they've developed these cool patterns, uh, for example, uh, this is disorder state. This is the chimera or the partially ordered, just a part of the system became ordered. And this is the clustering when you have two ordered groups. And as far as we know, this is the first report of a chimera with two ordered groups or two headed chimera, I don't know. Uh, it, it has two ordered groups. And come to my post.
so one at a time okay thank you okay yeah Poster number 16 will be delivered by Devasmita Mandal from the Indian Institute of Science in Mangalore, India, and she'll tell us about her work on crumpling of colloidal membranes on solidification. Good afternoon, everybody. The title of my poster is Crumpling of Colloidal Membranes on Solidification. So the system that I work on is a mixture of non-adsorbent polymers, which are marked in blue, and we use rod-shaped viruses, which are highly flexible, semi-flexible and highly charged as our colloidal rods. So when we mix them together, due to depletion attraction, the rods align along their long axis to form what is called one-dimensional membranes, which are colloidal, because they range from few microns to hundred of microns. And here is the top view of this colloidal membrane under the microscope. Now recently, we found out a new phase in this colloidal membrane system we, on changing some of the assembly conditions. Now I will show you the time sequence images of how this phase transition happens. So starting with, we have a fluid membrane which is flat with a circular edge. And then at some point nucleation sets in, it grows and have faceted edges. And when it grows further, the local buckling within the membrane is more prominent. And when this growing domain hits the membrane edge, the local buckling disappears and the membrane takes up an overall curvature which is more prominent in this rendered confocal microscopy image. Now why is this interesting? This is an example of a 2D crystallization which is fundamentally different from the 3D crystallization because of the finite size of boundary. You are welcome to my poster to know more about it. Thanks for your attention. a laser pointer mm -hmm. and then the arrows forward and back right here okay and I'll introduce you and we just said so Yuvan yeah Yuvan 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 okay okay very good the 17th and final poster for this uh, poster session number one was delivered by Yuvan Yuvan Teo from the San Paulo, Sao Paulo State University um, in Brazil, and he'll tell us about his work on the control of chaotic systems based on variable event conditions. Okay, hello everybody. This work presents a practical method to control chaotic systems, where no previous knowledge of the mathematical model of the system is required. The systems uh, considered in this work can be represented by this equation, where X are the states of the systems, Y is uh, the output signal of, of the system, and U is the control input that we have to design, but control event condition. Uh, to know how uh, the control is realized, we need to know uh, what is event condition. An event condition in this world is uh, is when the signal output uh, cross, cross over the signal uh, EC that is the average of the samples between two events. When this, this occurs, there is an event. It's marked by, like this. So uh, the, the control uh, is, the control design is uh, when this equation, okay, and the control acts in the system when an event occurs, just uh, like a control for by pulses. For this work, this control was applied to KSS chaotic circuit proposed by Kears, Smith, and Sproch, and we obtained these results, these satisfactory results, because uh, we obtain a periodic stable behavior 
of the states of the system. This one corresponds with the output of the, of the signal, and this one is the signal control of the, this system. That's all. Thank you for your question.